that's kind applause because there's going to be a demo. Um, might not be deserved, so it's good good to get it in. Um, yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, my name is Matt Turner. Uh, I'm a DevOps engineer, SRE, out of London. And I want to talk about progressive delivery. Uh, specifically, I guess I've called it cloud native progressive delivery. And what that really means, as we'll see, is just this idea of progressive delivery, uh, but in, in a cloud environment, right, in a Kubernetes environment, um, because it's easier uh, and because it's quicker and because it's a lot more possible now than it used to be. So hopefully I can even give you a, a demo of this thing that I'm talking about working, but but no promises. So deployment. Release delivery, whose who's release process looks sort of like this. Calm, you know, serene. Yeah, you stand at the end just on a hammock, you know, you press a button, everything's fine. So confident you could do it at 5 p.m. on a Friday, yeah? Um, who's, who's looks more like this? So, yeah, this is, this is something I found on Google. Um, apparently, people do this. Um, somebody was so proud of their work that they published this. So this is probably one of the better ones. Um, and, you know, while I'm here, I did a bit more Googling and, and people think about this stuff in really bright colors, really, really bright colors. Um, I think you'd have to take some acid to think this was a good idea. And then notice the development section on the left doesn't have a box that says programming. So anyway, uh, oh, and I found this one because um, I think a consultant made this. I think you pay for this and then you pay more money to have them explain what this means. You pay more money for the words probably by the character. Um, and of course, uh, agile people talk about uh, re delivery and release uh, and deployment in terms of trains. Love the train analogy. And actually, that's not a terrible model, I think. And, you know, you don't have to throw all of these ideas away. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to sort of say we should rip everything up. Um, so I think if you've got a process like this that still works uh, or a mental model, then you know, we don't have to completely throw it away. Um, but anyway, how does cloud native enable what I'm going to talk about? So I realize I haven't sort of exactly explained what progressive delivery is yet, but I did say that I think now we have a bunch of these cloud native tools. Now is a really good time to start looking at this. So what you know technologies am I going to be leaning on that get us uh, to this to this wonderful place? So I'm just going to really quickly go over some stuff. Um, if this is well, that's a purple box. Um, if, if this is a recap for you, then great. If this is if this is new, then maybe there's some um, you know some tools to go away in Google. Uh, I realise that this technology stack might be a bit aspirational for for some people with legacy concerns, but hopefully today shows you know you know what what is possible and where we can be. So we have an app, cool, right? Code runs in a process. Um, a while ago, you know, Heroku published this thing called the Twelve Factor App that had some opinions on on how you wrote that and how it uh, how it should run. This isn't perfect, you know. Uh, it really is how Heroku thinks you should build software. It's not perfect. It's a bit old, but it's you know, it's not wrong. I think uh, so. There's definitely some some ideas we can take. Um, a couple of those that I think are important is that what if your code should be in Git, right? It sounds simple, but that really is the place to start. Um, and it's not just code. You know, these days we know uh, we put a lot of sort of infrastructure definitions, a lot of YAML, basically. We put a lot of YAML in Git. Um, if you're writing Python, then you've just got a lot of significant white space, you know, in Git. That's what's important. You, you've got to save all of those spaces. Um, and the other thing that, you know, that again, sounds simple, but not everybody does, is, is having your config for, for your code be truly external, right? So no hard-coded port numbers, no hard-coded... Um, service discovery, no hard-coded names or locations of databases or upstream services. So we've got this process, it's pretty good. Uh, we put it in a container, right? Docker, great tool, um, slight to root on steroids for anybody who's not familiar. Uh, and this gives us a couple of things. It gives us runtime isolation. You know, if I make a programming mistake, I can't steal everybody else's CPU, I can't write over their files. Um, and, you know, 12 Factor talks about isolating your dependencies. But it also gives us this packaging format. I think when people say containers, they say Docker, they're sometimes a little bit careless. I think it's, it's really useful to think about the two separate things, the runtime isolation of the process uh, and the fact that a, uh, a Docker image that the container is made from is a really good packaging format, right? And it's, it's language agnostic. We don't have to deal with pips or are they eggs or yolks or wheels or I, I can't keep up, you know, and jars and something else. So don't forget the sort of packaging format aspect of this. 
Um, and while we're on the subject of things in containers, you know, if you if you do have a microservices architecture, and that's what we're sort of looking at, then it can be fairly useful to classify your microservices into a few different types. I won't spend too long on this, but you know, you usually have some kind of front end. There's often one microservice is a bit special. It's the thing the user talks to, you know, HTTP or REST or something nice. So HTML, sorry, or, or REST or something nice. And then a bunch of your services will be, you know, the back ends, the business logic. And then there's this nice pattern of having services that are adapters. So if you want to talk to a database or a third party API in the cloud or anything like that, you can make a microservice that everything uses to talk to it through. So the interface here would be something nice, you know, REST or gRPC or whatever, nice and uniform. You know, that cloud service might be XML. We might have a SQL database and a, and a Mongo database or something. But from the inside, everything else that wants to use them talks through these adapter shims that makes everything, you know, use our rate limiting mechanism, use our service discovery mechanism, use our authentication mechanism, and presents a uniform API. And that's uh, something that'll, that'll come up later. Um, of course, microservices, the dream is we can scale them independently. And we probably want to deploy that stuff into Kubernetes. That's a huge topic, so I won't say any more than that. Um, but it is you know, going to be part of the demo today. The next thing we want to add is a service mesh. Um, if anybody is not familiar with that, this is the logo of, of Istio, which is one service mesh. Others exist. Um, basically, takes an HTTP proxy and sticks it onto every container that you run, right? So you've got, imagine an Nginx reverse proxy that you might configure yourself. Well, that'll be deployed automatically by the service mesh system. And there's a, you know, a, a control plane, a central point that can configure all of these in, you know, interesting and consistent ways. Given that we have our software running in Kubernetes uh, and with a service mesh, we can get a bunch of interesting metrics from it. So, you know, scraping, scraping all the metrics is definitely a thing you should do. If, it, if something has a Prometheus exporter, if it possibly has metrics, you should go read them. Uh, and when we're talking about metrics, I might use the phrase red, red metrics. So this is a, a common set of things we gather, which is rates, errors, and duration. So how many requests a second is my service getting? How many of those is it responding to with an error? And how long did it take? What, you know, what was the latency? What was the duration? And when we are gathering metrics like those red metrics, we can start to talk about service levels. So this is the, the definitions from the Google SRE workbook, right? Uh, and the important ones are we can talk about an SLO, a service level objective. So how uh, much of an error rate is acceptable? What uh, is the maximum latency we accept? And then we can talk about an SLI, which is how we actually measure that. So at what point am I measuring the latency? How am I averaging it across instances? Uh, you know, am I taking a mean of the distribution or a percentile or something? Um, it's important to be fairly precise about that. Otherwise, people just end up with complete, completely different numbers and completely different expectations. So one last thing, I think, uh, that gets us here. Um, and this is why I'm saying this is, this is cloud native, right? Because we're really building on a lot of, of recent advances, not only in, in technology. You know, I think Terraform, Docker, Kubernetes, these are all incredible tools. Uh, they've they've really changed the game in the amount of toil and work you have to do day to day. But they are just tools. But there's also been some you know some real ideas, some big ideas, some real changes in the way that we do things. Uh, and infrastructure as code is one of those things. You know, terraform all the infrastructure and write all the AML to make Kubernetes do things. And then GitOps, which uh, hands up, who's familiar with with GitOps? Who's sort of Heard the phrase, understand what it means. Okay, that's that's probably about half of people. I'll try to try to do it justice. So the idea is that Git is the source of truth for what is running. So rather than go and run a piece of software and then not do anything and then panic when we have an outage because I don't know what pieces of software should be running, or rather than run a piece of software and then maybe write it down, you know, on a confluence or uh, even you know write it, um, you know, make a file in Git and. Um, push that into Git so I then have this, you know, I, this is nice, right? I could have a version controlled sort of um, record of what should be running over time. It's, it's, it's a Merkle tree. It's basically a blockchain. Great. But GitOps says that rather than running software and then writing it down, I should commit into Git a document that says what I want to run. Guess what? It's YAML. And then I'll have an agent that actually goes and makes that run. So it's, it's Git first. So Git says what my infrastructure should look like what applications should be running, what versions they should be at. 
and then we have an, a CD system, an agent that makes that happen rather than you know any other kind of um, you know, uh, sort of recording or, or backups or anything after the fact. And if I explain that very well, um, GitOps is a kind of complicated thing. Um, so what are we doing for, for deployments now? What I see a lot of people do is, you know, CI. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of good practices out there. We've been doing this for for a while. We're not bad at it. Um, so CI is probably the first step, right? W what is continuous integration? Well, it actually has an old fashioned, an original meaning that I think has kind of been lost. Um, we'll actually come back to it later. The the original meaning of CI, but what everybody means these days is continuous build. Really, right? I've got a Jenkins or a Circle CI or something. Every new commit, it takes my app, it, it compiles it, it runs the tests. Nice and simple. So then what comes with CI CD? Well, what's, what's a deployment? To me, a deployment is taking a piece of software, uh, taking a package, so one of those container images, because they're a really nice packaging format, and running it. So hold that thought. So what does continuous deployment mean when it means Deploying all the time, right? If continuous integration, continuous build is, is building every commit to master, then continuous deployment is running every new container image that, that comes out of that sausage factory. But that brings us on to progressive delivery. So, so what's a release? Well, if we define the term release as meaning, you know, exposing uh, a piece of software to users, or vice versa, exposing users to a piece of software, um, then if, if we define it like that, then we can kind of think, well, how's that different to, to deployment? Because I think people often get the, the, you know, sort of terms mixed up. They use them to mean the same thing because this is what we're scared of, right? Programming is hard. Software might be bad. So it's having users actually use the new piece of software that we're scared of. So it's releasing that we want to actually control. So, you know, if we had a continuous release system, then we would be exposing every new piece of software that runs straight to users. And what are we running? Well, everything that we build. And what are we building? Everything that we commit to main, right? So as soon as you push to main, it's out in users' hands. And that's that's a dangerous chain if we can't be completely sure that our software's right, which we probably can't. So does, you know, this deployment thing necessarily mean this this release? I think often it does um, because of the way that we deploy things, because of the way that our infrastructure is set up. Um, so it means that when we deploy, we release. And because we don't want to release all the time, we don't deploy. Or we deploy somewhere else. We'll have uh, you know the dreaded test environment or staging or pre-prod or whatever you want to call it, probably all three. Um, so every time something gets merged, it gets built and it gets deployed, but it gets deployed into this test thing because it's implicitly being released, but because it's deployed into test, it's released to the users of test, who are, you know, maybe the devs and the, and the QA people. It's not getting released to end users. And that's how we kind of skipping around this, this uh, problem at the moment, right? So it's automatically released to test, and then somebody sort of has a look and decides whether they think it's any good, and then we promote it. You know, we give it this nice word that sounds like you're, you're going to get more money. Um, and what that means is taking some software and, and going, okay, prod, then... I wasn't prepared to let a machine do it, but I'm totally capable of taking that decision. So I think we now have the technology to mean that deployment isn't necessarily the same as release, right? And then, you know, in the olden days, sure, if I had, you know, I had a server that ran my software you know, in my data center, if I had a new version of the software, I would have to shell in and I'd have to, you know, copy the jar across and I'd have to stop the old one because there's only one port 80 and then I'd start the new one. So I've just released it sort of to everybody at once. So releasing was a, was a scary, scary thing. Um, you know, and deploying was probably kind of copying that jar onto the server. So I may as well, you know, I'm going to be realistically releasing it at the same time. But if we can uncouple these two things, then we can get a lot more out of the system. Um, so one last thing from, from 12 Factor, and again, not, you know, not a bad idea. It says that dev and prod should be the same. There should be parity between dev and prod. Um, and it means the you know the environments, and actually it talks about a development environment, a staging environment, a production environment. So that's already three. Um, 
so why am I focused so much on this deployment thing? Why, why am I sort of defining this term and, and contrasting it to, to a release? Um, why am I so keen to do this? Well, firstly, because these test environments are never realistic. As I say, I think 12 factors is not a bad idea, but it's a little bit out of date. I think test environments shouldn't really exist because they're never as realistic as we think they are. Uh, and the more realistic they are, the more expensive they are. You know, how much, how often have you had what you thought was a test environment? You know, it's your laptop. And you're like, oh, okay, we should build a, a server or a cluster or a cloud environment that, you know, is is more realistic than my laptop is, but it's got the right, it's got the same kind of database. We should be using, we should be using Postgres rather than just SQLite on the laptop. Oh, we do actually, yeah, that that web application firewall we've deployed, yeah, no, we, that's in prod and it's, it's caused some issues, so we need one of those in test as well. And before you know it, you know, Terraform's great, you press a button and you get a complete copy of your production environment and you call it test, but it's costing you $10,000 a month. Um, so there's a bunch of reasons, I think, to get rid of these test environments. Uh, and that's, that's you know, one of the things we can do. So what does this new approach look like? Um, build doesn't really change. Uh, we've got some, some code here for, you know, version one, we push it to Git. Continuous integration system, continuous build system, uh, comes along and builds it and makes, you know, an artifact. We've got version one. So say, if this is a Docker image, this is a lot easier because then it just runs um, and we don't care what language is inside it. Uh, and that's it, right? So the contract of this of this continuous build system is that it's triggered by any new commit to main, um, and that should be a PR, not a you know not a force push, but any commit to main, and it produces a new container image and it pushes it to the registry, um, and you know it, it is a CI system, so it can do the bottom of that agile you know, testing hierarchy. You want to find errors as early as possible, so the compiler, the linter, unit test, all of those stuff will, will definitely help you out. You know, if something could get no further than this, fine. Um, but that is the contract for this continuous integration system, because you, you, you know, you see a lot of people with, with Jenkins or Travis or whatever will be set up to build something and then also to push it. It'll run a little script that will call App Engine or call Heroku or call kubectl. Um, I'm saying that this, this stops there with an, uh, and, you know, an image being delivered to the registry. So what about the deployment stage? Well, so this is GitOps. Again, um, maybe a diagram is going to help for people who, uh, who haven't heard of this before. So kind of completely separate, right? This is our running system. Um, what I've got is a Git repository, a separate Git repository saying what should be running. So if you're using Kubernetes, this is full of Kubernetes YAMLs. If you're using something else, um, it can almost certainly take some other flavor of YAML, right, as its, as its input. Uh, and then there's a little agent that looks in that repository and syncs it into the cluster. So it says, okay, we've got a YAML saying there should be two copies, you know, a version one running. Well, I'll, I'll go and make that happen. That's, this is continuous deployment. So this is the GitOps model of continuous deployment. Um, and, you know, we're going to get more advanced with this stuff. But, you know, if you haven't seen this before, I think this is a great thing to take away from today. You know, we have these two separate Git repositories. We have the, the you know, image getting as far as the registry on the one side and then completely decoupled is this YAML that says, right, over in that registry, you should find a version one image, it should be running, and then an agent makes that happen. So this thing gets traffic, right? We've got a user down here, this is your load balancer, your Kubernetes ingress or whatever, and you know, users send traffic in, traffic goes to, uh, to those containers. So far, so standard, you know, very standard Kubernetes behavior. So if we then add another agent, uh, this is more GitOps stuff. If we add another agent that watches that image repo, this is how we uh, decouple uh, this sort of build and deploy stages. Because that agent, when we commit new code for version two into the source Git and it gets built, a container image ends up in um, in the registry. And then again, that stops, right? There's no there's no event comes from the left here to the right. This, this image goes in the registry and that's sort of the build contract finished. But then this agent says, ah, right, well, there's a V2. So this is probably something we're interested in. If I just go and update the Git repository to say that V2 should be running now, then, you know, the agent will make it happen and we'll get a V2. We might not want this to happen automatically if that meant that V2 immediately got half the traffic, all of the traffic. You know, if you, if you just do this in Kubernetes, it'll, it'll do its sort of rolling deployment thing and it'll immediately start sending it a bunch of traffic. Uh, and that might not be what we want. So introducing 
another agent, uh, another controller that looks at what whatever's running and controls this load balancer, right? So this is all, this may seem a little bit backwards. It may seem there's a lot of lines on this diagram, but that's because it's all event-based. Uh, you know, it's all based on watching things. And that's, you know, that's good. That makes it very decoupled. Um, it's sometimes a little hard to get your head around, but it's it's all it's all nice and, and separate. Each part of the system does its own thing and, you know, hopefully does it well. So a new image appears. The first agent says, oh yeah, there's a new image. Uh, I should update this infrastructure Git just to say there's a new image. And then second agent says, ah, a new image is referencing Git. Cool, we should be running that. We should deploy it. And then this third agent basically says, right, but we don't want to release it yet. I can see that there's two separate things running, version one and version two. You know, I know that they have the same name, so I know they're sort of the same app, but there's their V1 and V2. I'm going to tell that load balancer, I'm going to override that load balancer. And this is what you need a service mesh for to get that kind of control. Uh, I'm going to override that load balancer to keep all of the traffic going to version one. So it's now deployed, but it's not released because user traffic isn't going to it yet. So the contract for this kind of deploy stage is, as I said, triggered by a new image appearing, and it deploys to the production system. I'm using Kubernetes words here, you know, the production cluster, the production namespace, but you can build this in another system if you wanted, and it doesn't get any user traffic. So what can we do with this? It's sitting there, it's running, it's, it's in production, so it's got the production configuration applied to it. It's got action, access to the production database. It's subject to production resource limits, right? All of the things that, that trip you up in prod, uh, you know, where test isn't a reliable replica of that, you know, all of that's gone away. We are, there's no dev prod parity uh, because there is no dev, right? We are running in production. So what can we do with it while it's there? Well, we can, it's available for us to test. Um, if I come along as a tester, because this load balancer is, is made uh, by, by Istio or by Linkerd, by one of these service meshes, it's, it's smart, right? It's layer seven, HTTP aware. So all the user requests are coming in and they go into version one, but as a tester, I can start sending my test requests. And if I put a, a, a well-known header on them, and, you know, HTTP header, like X test, yes, please, then my traffic will go to version two. So it's available to test just like it would be on my laptop or a test environment. You know, I can kick the tires manually. I can use Postman, I can use a test script, but it's running in production. I can get my traffic to it, but the users aren't subjected to it, not yet. The other thing that can happen is that that agent that is kind of, mon is kind of managing this, this rollout that said, oh yeah, there's a new thing, but I won't send it any traffic yet, not from the users, it can start up automated tests, right? It can start up an automated test thing that fires all our regression test suite at it, that sends a load test at it and does any you know anything you can think of anything you can script to validate this and this is just automated integration testing right i'm not i'm not talking about anything crazy here but the thing is running as i say again the thing is running you know um in prod um so uh, yeah at this stage we're testing Simple sounding things like, you know, does it even start? Um, I've definitely had software that starts in test and doesn't start in prod because it can't find the right database or the, can't talk to a back end because of a firewall rule or something. And it's available for all the usual stuff, manual testing, integration testing, um, the kind of non-functional testing that I think, you know, is really important. Um, performance testing, security fuzzing, all of that kind of stuff that's always different in prod because the prod environment is always different, um, whether we, we want to say it is or not. Um, and yeah, it's kind of important to note that for this kind of non-functional stuff, like the performance, we, te we test the performance maybe with a load test. And if it's not where we expect it to be, then nothing goes any further, right? We're, we're still going through our sort of progressive delivery, our rollout, and, and the system will stop there. If, the, if, you know, maybe everything works fine, it doesn't crash, but the latency is too high when it's talking, you know, talking to the prod database along with everything else. And that's a bit slow and it's subject to the sort of prod CPU limits. Um, if, if the performance, you know, if the old version had an acceptable performance and the new one doesn't, then the rollout stops. The other thing we can do with it, you know, being in prod and being right there is we can send a mirror of the user traffic to it, right? Because these new, um, copies, this version two, isn't a million miles away in some test cluster, um, that's, you know, sort of impossible to reach and it's not running in some different environment because it's literally right next to version one, we can send it a mirror of the traffic. Uh, so you can count all of the test cases you want, right? You can have all of the all of the generated 
traffic, all of the generated queries, all of the replayed regression queries that you want, some user will think of something that you never thought of, right? They will try to use your, your software in a way that you just never imagined they would be crazy enough to do, and it'll crash or it'll have an error. Um, so this is a really good way of testing things, and you can leave it there just getting this mirror of user traffic for as long as you want. Uh, and it, But we, we drop the responses, right? So the user always has a good experience because the user always gets the response from version one uh, the response from version two is dropped on the floor, but version two is seeing that traffic and we can look at its error rates and we can look at its latency and we can look at its logs and we can see if it just blows up. Uh, so yeah, that's what I, I guess what I was going to say there. We can inspect what it's up to. We can inspect the kind of replies it gives and how long they take. And we can also look at diffs between the two sets of replies. You know, if we've added a new feature, then this isn't, you know, I guess we're expecting to change the output. We're expecting to add more. This isn't applicable. Um, but if what if this new version is meant to be a bug fix, a performance improvement, another non-functional thing, then it can actually be worth looking at the differences between the two because yeah, this should be the same. Um, and this is the kind of change that we should be pushing to production all the time. You know, like um, GitHub Depender Bot will come along every time one of your you know libraries has a CVE or gets an update. Depender Bot will raise you a PR to say, oh, I think you should use this new version of, of a library instead. I'm always a little bit scared to click accept, right? Because it might break something. But if we can have that be completely automated, because all of this deployment stuff is completely automated up to this point, we know for all of those commits, the output should never change. You know, we've just got a newer version of a library that should be a little bit better somehow but behind the scenes. You know, we can get it to this stage, run it in prod, and then just fail it if our output ends up changing. So that brings us to the actual release stage, right? Because up to this point, we, you know, we've got user traffic in, but we haven't sent anything back. We've done a whole load of stuff. We're running in prod. We're seeing real traffic. We're having real world performance tests, real world regression tests, but we haven't actually released by that definition because no user is ever going to have a bad day because they haven't got a potentially bad response from, you know, a, a new piece of software. Uh, so we can now release. And the way we can do that is, well, we have this smart load balancer, right? We have this, we were able to have both versions running and send all of the traffic to V1. And you can't do that even with vanilla Kubernetes, right? You, you, they'd all, they'd just get traffic, for, they'd all get a quarter of it each. So with this advanced traffic management, if we're able to do, to do things like zero traffic, we can also do things like 1% traffic, 2% traffic, 3% traffic. And that agent we've got will can automatically see this through as well. So in the demo I'm gonna show, if we, if we get to it, um, it will run these kind of automated tests. It'll run through the whole suite of automated tests. And then it runs a load test for a minute or 30 minutes or whatever you configure. And then it can go through a stage of sending a mirror of the traffic for a minute or a day or something and see if you start to crash. And then if all of those pass, we can start sending 1% of traffic. So this is a release. This technically is the first point where the users might have a bad time. I think what I'm saying with all of this new technology and all of these new ways of doing things is I am happy for this now to be automatic, right? So we've decoupled that initial deployment from this, from this release. And because we can do this very progressive, very gradual release, I would see no reason, unless we're being super, super paranoid, that this couldn't be automatic. You know, if you think about a normal release process where you have promotion to prod or you have gating and you have sign off, all of that's because that release is a, is a big leap, okay? We tend to go from sort of 0% traffic to 100% traffic, or at least if we if we let Kubernetes do a rollout or Heroku do a rollout, it's not that sophisticated. It just goes 10%, 20%, 30%, and, and backs off if things start to, to crash. Um, whereas in this case, we can do 1%, 2%, we can keep an eye on the duration, we can keep an eye on the error rates, and we really should know what it's gonna be like because it's seen production user traffic in production, right? I think one of the main reasons we have sign off is because somebody has to take a gamble. You know, you've done this testing in the test environment and you you know that it's not re um, realistic, really. You're kind of implicitly admitting that by saying, oh, we've done, we've got this test environment. We've done testing. Yeah, it's, it's called test. It must be testing. And then you have to go to a senior manager to ask if you're allowed to release it. And why is that? Well, because it really is actually still a bit of a gamble because the information you got from test isn't actually telling you that much about what's going to happen in prod. But I think going through all of these steps, we just gradually, gradually get slightly closer every time. So this, 
Uh, and you can you can retain a manual gate between between this step and this step if you want. But uh, you know this is definitely something that all these agents can do automatically. And I think I'm saying this is as safe as we can possibly make things. So again, one percent of traffic. Um, if any of those SLOs, you know, the error rate, the latency, you know, go out of whack. Um, if if they go outside of the SLO that we agreed with the stakeholders, if the thing starts to crash, if it starts to use too many resources, you know, it's doing the right thing in the right time, but it's just going to cost too much because it's now using 10x the CPU. You know, if any of those things start to go wrong, this agent is keeping an eye on all of that because it's watching all of those metrics that we gathered, and it'll stop the deployment and roll it back. So we can then give it a bit more traffic uh, and a bit more traffic. So this is, you know, the the progressive rollout, as I said, sort of one percent. More, with constant monitoring, 2% constant monitoring, and then roll back if it ever goes wrong. And of course, you you can leave the new version running, and it's running in the production environment. You know, it's completely realistic. You just leave it there with no track. You don't have to, like, kill the server and restore from a snapshot, right? You can just leave that pod running there, but with no traffic. So a developer can can start manually testing it, sending requests, inspecting it, trying to work out what's gone wrong. And of course, you know, we, we raise an alarm. Um, so this hopefully will be the first time uh, any kind of dev um, or you know release manager has to be eyes on glass. You don't have to panic about these things. You don't have to watch them. I just wanted to touch on actually maybe I'll do the demo and come back to that. Um, oh, technology is hard. How am I going to do this? But I can't possibly type in here and look up there. The screen's too big. So this is what I expected. Can we read this? We can't really. Can we? Can we? Can we? Anybody? Can, can anybody not read it? Okay. Yeah. It's struggling at the back. Let me see if I can. I thought I changed it. Not really. I'm a Linux user that's been given a Mac, so um, we do things the hard way. But wait. Why aren't you picking that up? Okay, we can read that, all right? Um, I hope I haven't left anything special in the environment. Okay, so I've got a Kubernetes cluster running. I think, rather foolishly, I haven't actually installed our software. Okay, so blank mini kube cluster. So the first thing I'm going to do is is some GitOps. So all this script is doing, it's one command really. It's ap applying that first agent that we saw, that that synchronization agent that looks at what is in a Git repository and makes it uh, actually happen into a cluster. So I've got a uh, Git repository here with a bunch of YAMLs in it, right? A bunch of Kubernetes YAMLs for all the infrastructure I want in this cluster, um, you know, including the it's sort of Istio, the service mesh, and whatever else, and uh, the one the one app that we're going to be running. So all of the sort of you know the deployment YAML, the service YAML are. Here in this Git repository, they were in Git first. We could come along, we could eyeball them, we could talk about what they should look like in PRs, and then by installing this agent into the cluster, um, uh, which is downloading some images, which might take a little while on this Wi-Fi, um, this will actually become uh, become what's really running. Okay, they're all coming along. I couldn't think of a nice, this is going to be a lot of terminal, I couldn't think of a nice way to visualize this. That's why I drew all those pictures. But I guess I wanted to show, I wanted to show that these tools actually exist. I, you know, I haven't just made this up. Um, it's something you can do today. I think I wanted to show how easy this stuff is to use, uh, how fairly quick it is when, you know, when the Wi-Fi bottleneck's gone away. Um, and 
uh, yeah, kind of how, how nice they are. A lot of them have nice CLIs and nice monitoring. So I just, you know, if I can get through it in 10 minutes, then there's no excuse for anybody not to go back to the office and, and you know, try this out. Because it only, yeah, the Wi-Fi was a lot faster earlier when I, uh, when I tried it. We're installing a lot of software. Okay. It's all going to take a little while. Oh man, okay, what are we doing next? So let's just punch a hole into that network. It's definitely not what should be happening. Oh no, wait, pod is not running. There we go. Come on. Okay, it might take a little while to do this. Um, trust me, it all works, I guess. Um, the, the, the demo is going to be as simple as I have a um, little, little piece of software I wrote called Blue Green. Uh, it literally gives you a web page that's either blue or green. Um, there on Docker Hub, there is a, an image tagged 1.0.0, which is blue. Uh, and I was going to change it to be green, tag that as 1.0.1, .1, push that up to Docker Hub. And then you see all the machinery comes into, comes into action. Um, it gets deployed into the cluster, but it doesn't get any traffic. And then we can just watch the agent go through and say 10, 20, 30%. Um, there's some nice CLIs to interact with that if you're a CLI person, and there's also nice Grafana dashboards as well. So each one of those components has a Grafana dashboard, um, and for the blue-green thing, I could bring up a dashboard, and uh, oh, it's starting to happen. For the blue-green thing, I could bring up a dashboard, and you can it's really neat. You can sort of see traffic come into one and go down on the other. You can see the CPU usage sort of go up a little bit. Um, oh, it's kind of doing its thing. Come on. I don't think we're going to get through it. We might be able to see some of the dashboards by now, though. No, it hasn't brought that component up yet either. Okay, I will probably stop there and take some questions.